Welcome to St. Margaret's Church at Westminster Abbey. It's a delight to have you with us for this dialogue on Christmas and the Quran, which we have organized jointly with the Ginkgo Foundation. And we're grateful to Ginkgo for the support that it offers to Embrace the Middle East and the Christian Muslim Forum, two organizations with which the Abbey has partnered as part of its community and social engagement work. The dialogue will be introduced by some readings from the Quran and the Gospels. And then Professor Carl Yusuf Kuschel, the Emeritus Professor of Catholic Theology from the University of Tübingen, will give a, an address to which Dr. Mohammed Gamal Abdul Noor, a faculty member of the Al Azhar University, will respond. There will be uh, some further readings, address and response before we get to the opportunity for questions and some interaction with our panelists. So without further ado, let us begin with a reading from Surah 19. This is an account of your Lord's grace towards his servant, Zechariah, when he called to his Lord secretly saying, Lord, my bones have weakened and my hair is ashen gray, but never, Lord, have I prayed to you in vain. I fear what my kinsmen will do when I am gone, for my wife is barren. So grant me a successor, a gift from you, to be my heir and the heir of the family of Jacob. Lord, make him well-pleasing to you. Zechariah, we bring you good news of a son whose name will be John. We have chosen this name for no one before him. He said, Lord, how can I have a son when my wife is barren and I am old and frail? He said, this is what your Lord has said. It is easy for me. I created you, though you were nothing before. He said, give me a sign, Lord. He said, your sign is that you will not be able to speak to anyone for three full days and nights. He went out of the sanctuary to his people and signaled to them to praise God morning and evening. We said, John, hold on to the scripture firmly. While he was still a boy, we granted him wisdom, tenderness from us, and purity. He was devout, kind to his parents, not domineering or rebellious. Peace was on him the day he was born, the day he died, and it will be on him the day he is raised to life again. Mention in the Kitab the story of Mary. She withdrew from her family to a place to the east and secluded herself away. We sent our spirit to appear before her in the form of a perfected man. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytanir rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Qalat inni a'uzu bir rahmani minka in kunta taqiyya. Qala inna ma ana rasoolu rabbiki li ahaba laki ghulama zakiyya. قالت أنا يكون لي غلام ولم يمسسني بشر ولم أك بغيا قال كذلك قال ربك هو علي هين ولنجعله آية للناس ورحمة منا ورحمة منا وكان أمرا مقضيا She said I seek the Lord of mercy's protection against you. If you have any fear of him, do not approach. But he said, I am but a messenger from your Lord, come to announce to you the gift of a pure son. She said, how can I have a son when no man has touched me? I have not been unchaste. And he said, this is what your Lord said. It is easy for me. We shall make him a sign to all people, a blessing from us. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee 
called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, as I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, he will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month of her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Thank you for those readings which have wonderfully set the scene for us. It gives me great delight and considerable honour to uh, welcome you, Professor Carl Yusuf Kuschel, uh, here to St Margaret's Church in Westminster Abbey. It, well, thank you for the invitation. It is a great honor and pleasure to be part of uh, that dialogue and I'm looking forward to, uh, to the process uh, of this enterprise. Imam Dr. Mohammed Gamal Abdul Noor, it is similarly a delight and uh, privilege to be able to welcome you here to St. Margaret's Church at Westminster Abbey. Thanks a lot, Canon Bo. Uh, I'm really honored to be with you today. So I wonder if I might now ask Professor Kushel to give us his first address. The Quran text we just heard, presenting the Annunciation and birth of John, whom Christians call the Baptist and Muslims call a prophet, is part of Surah 19, revealed, chronologically speaking, in the second period of Mecca between 615 and 620. Surah 19 is a special one because for the first time Christian traditions are integrated into the Quranic message. In earlier surahs, tradition of Jewish origin are received and newly interpreted by the Quran. The story of Adam, for instance, Noah, Moses or Abraham. Now in Surah 19, for the first time, figures like Jesus and Mary, central to Christians, are received and newly interpreted by the Quran. This is remarkable because it, show, it allows two conclusions. First, the addressees of the prophetic message in Mecca around 615 must have been familiar with the Christian narrative of the birth of Jesus in connection with the John story as we have it in the Gospel of Luke. And second, the Quran is familiar with an orthodox Christological interpretation of the Christ event by Christians and interprets the Christ event in a very different, yes, even controversial manner, as we will see at the end of the birth story. It is for Christian readers remarkable indeed that also in the Quran, the narratives of John and his father Zechariah and of Jesus and Mary are closely interconnected, like in the Gospel of Luke, 
chapter 1 and 2. But whereas we find in both stories the same personnel under the same circumstances, Zechariah and his wife uh, uh, long for a successor, a heir of the family of Jacob, in vain, he is too old and his wife is barren. So we find in the opening of Surah 19, Zechariah in deep prayer to God to grant him his grace and to give him a sign. All these features we also find in the Gospel of Luke. But the theological function of the two Annunciation stories are completely different. Whereas the evangelist used John as a figure of contrast with Jesus, as a mere harbinger who can be outdone by Jesus to impressive effect, the Quran uses John as a parallel figure in whom God has already accomplished a deed that he then repeats with the birth of Jesus. In other words, the two stories in Surah 19 have a theocentric and creation theological goal. They are supposed to demonstrate to the primary audience that the God announced by Muhammad the prophet had long ago shown the will and the power to breach natural biological ties laying down a marker of creativity. An old married couple, Zechariah and his wife, are granted a son against all the odds of nature. Immediately afterwards, unmarried Mary falls pregnant without the intervention of a man and gives birth to a child. We find already here the answer to the question, why is the birth of Jesus, the most significant feature of the Quranic image of Jesus, strongly repeated again in the later Surah 3. The answer can only be with birth stories one can demonstrate the unconditional power of God, the Creator. Birth stories capture the instant in which God creates life from nothing proving himself the supreme creator. In a nutshell, so to speak, we are able to read already the story of John as theocentric account of creation theology. This objective is expressed in the verse Surah 19.9, it is easy for me, I created you though you were nothing before. And again, in the conclusion of the birth story, when God decrees something, he says only be, and it is. To conclude, the two birth stories are of theocentric, not Christocentric character. That is the specific focus of the Quranic message at all, and a critical provocation to Christian orthodoxy. For a careful reader of the Quran, that is not a surprise, because one will observe that Christian Christocentricity is by the Quran consequently replaced by theocentricity. Accordingly, Jesus is in the following text of Surah 19 depicted as a sign of God's creative power, a creation of God's spirit, not of human potential. And exactly that explains why we in the following passage will find the motif virgin birth also in the Quran, a traditional symbol of God's creative power familiar also to Christians. As will be said in Surah 1920 and 21, how can I have a son when no man has touched me? asks Mary. And the answer of the angel of the Lord is, that is what our Lord said, it is easy for me. We shall make him a sign to all people, a blessing from us. Thank you for that, Professor Kushal. It is now the opportunity for uh, Imam Muhammad to respond. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kushal, before I offer my response, 
for the first part of your exegesis. Let me uh, congratulate you on your amazing book, uh, Christmas and the Quran. Uh, the book actually did not only enrich my knowledge about the biblical tradition, but also deepen my knowledge of my own tradition, which is uh, the Quran and Hadith, uh, in the sense that I came to the Quran with new eyes, uh, freshly looking at different interpretations and possibilities of reading the Quranic text. So that's an amazing achievement, and I'm really grateful for the contribution to knowledge and Muslim-Christian relations. Um, regarding the first part of your exegesis, uh, I, I really agree with much of, of what you have said, uh, but I'm not sure the, the addressees uh, regarding, the, uh, I agree especially with the second conclusion, but for the first conclusion that you've uh, drawn, which is that the, the, the addressees of, the, of, the, of, of chapter 19 uh, were basically the disbelievers of Mecca were familiar, must have been familiar with uh, the, 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 the birth story of Jesus and John. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that, that, that this has been the case. Uh, chapter 19 is, addresses Prophet Muhammad himself in the first place rather than uh, the, the, the unbelievers of, uh, of, of Mecca. Uh, and this is uh, on the basis uh, of the fact that chapter 19, uh, Surah Maryam, uh, comes in a series uh, between Surah, uh, eight, uh, Surah uh, chapter 18 and chapter, uh, chapter 20. Chapter 18, it, Surah Al-Kahf, it, 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 it basically, basically mentions the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the situation of Prophet Muhammad, the psychological need, uh, his own psychological state, uh, um, describing how he was basically devastated by his people's response to his message. So uh, in the beginning of uh, chapter 18, it says, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعٌ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِلَّا مِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَ Are you uh, going to worry yourself to death because they, 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 don't believe, they, they don't believe in your message? And then the next surah after, surah, after chapter 19, which is chapter 20, it mentions the same, it, it touches upon the very, the, the very same psychological state of Prophet Muhammad, meaning that he was very let down by his people. And, and the, 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 the next surah starts with this, describing the, 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 that state. مَا أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكَ الْقُرْآنَ لِتَشْقَى we, This book, it wasn't, uh, meaning the Quran was not sent down to you uh, for you to be uh, distressed, but rather for you to be uh, in a state of, 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 of enlightenment and happiness. Uh, chapter 19 comes in this series uh, in the sense that it came primarily to comfort Prophet Muhammad by way of telling him that you're not alone. Previous messengers, previous prophets ha were always uh, supported by God, uh, and the, the surah then begins with the birth of John, uh, the birth of Jesus, and then it continues with Abraham, Moses, and, 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 and Ishmael, and, and, and Idris. And the common denominator between all those prophets was the presence of God's mercy. So the, 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 the first, the, 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 in the beginning of the surah, it says, Dhikr rahmati rabbika abdahu zakariya. This is an account of the mercy that God has shown that you, God, that you, Lord Muhammad, has shown to his, to his servant, uh, Zechariah. And then the theme of mercy is also mentioned, is very present in, in the birth, in the story of Jesus' uh, birth. The same applies to Abraham's story. The same applies to, to Moses' story. In fact, uh, the general pattern of the Quran, where you have uh, Moses is mentioned, normally it discusses his, his scenario with Pharaoh and the oppression that uh, the Israelites were having in Egypt. Uh, and Abraham is normally mentioned in relation to him destroying the idols of his, uh, of his people. Yet in this very surah, uh, the focus is primarily on the mercy that was shown to Moses, the mercy that was shown to Abraham. Uh, so uh, the whole point is that chapter 19 uh, um, 
does not necessarily mean uh, that the addressees, the unbelievers of Mecca, were the, pr the primary recipient of this, of this message, but rather Prophet Muhammad himself to comfort and tell the Prophet that you're not left alone. Thank you. Well, that's a uh, um, uh, very uh, interesting dimension, uh, um, Dr. Muhammad, to, uh, to take on uh, the professor's uh, introductory uh, exegesis. I think probably it's best if we if we keep the dialogue going, maybe to uh, hear of, uh, um, some more of uh, Surah 19 uh, in that uh, context which you've set for us, uh, and then we uh, can come back to uh, some further contributions. And so it was ordained. She conceived him. She withdrew to a distant place, and when the pains of childbirth drove her to cling to the trunk of a palm tree, she exclaimed, I wish I'd been dead and forgotten long before all this. But a voice cried to her from below, Do not worry. Your Lord has provided a stream at your feet. And if you shake the trunk of the palm tree towards you, it will deliver fresh ripe dates for you. So eat, drink, be glad, and say to anyone you may see, I have vowed to the Lord of mercy to abstain from conversation, and I will not talk to anyone today. She went back to her people, carrying the child, and they said, Mary, you have done something terrible. Sister of Aaron, your father was not an evil man. Your mother was not unchaste. She pointed at him, and they said, How can we converse with an infant? قال إني عبد الله آتاني الكتاب وجعلني نبيا وجعلني مباركا أينما كنت وأوصاني بالصلاة والزكاة ما دمت حيا وبرا بوالدتي ولم يجعل لي جبارا شقيا والسلام علي يوم ولدت ويوم أموت ويوم أبعث حيا ذلك عيسى بن مريم قول الحق الذي فيه يمترون. He said, I am a servant of God. He has granted me the scripture, made me a prophet made me blessed wherever I may be. He commanded me to pray, to give alms as long as I live, to cherish my mother. He did not make me domineering or graceless. Peace was on me the day I was born and will be on me the day I die and the day I am raised to life again. Such was Jesus, son of Mary, this is a statement of the truth about which they are in doubt. It would not befit God to have a child. He is far above that. When he decrees, he says only, be, and it is. Thank you for that. Now, having heard the voice of Jesus from the Quran, we return to a second contribution from Professor Kushel. Professor. We are now prepared to compare the accounts of the New Testament and the Quran. One finds some notable similarities as well as some essential differences. First, the similarities. Both the New Testament and the Quran interpret the birth of Jesus as a miraculous act performed by God for the benefit of humankind. One remarkable aspect is that whereas the New Testament essentially restricts God's miraculous design to the angels' appearances to Zechariah, Mary and the shepherds, along with the astrologers following a star, the Quran adds a miraculous speech by the newborn baby, as we heard. The Quran clearly has no scruple about having the newborn baby Jesus speak words of comfort to his mother. 
and utter prophetic statements about himself. And why should it? As with John, it uses the story of the birth of Jesus as a powerful illustration of its central theological tenet. We can therefore formulate a first point of consensus between the New Testament and the Quran. The birth, in the birth stories of the New Testament and the Quran, God holds sway over the seemingly impossible. God is free in his actions, breaking through all earthly boundaries and human parameters. Old barren women are made fertile again. Young women become pregnant without the participation of a man. God creates new life in the empty dead desert. A newborn child speaks with the force and self-assurance of an adult. In Surah 19, as we heard, is Jesus is not born in a stable, but near a palm tree with water in a source. Again, a symbol of creative power and fertility. This leads on to a second point of consensus between the New Testament and the Quran. In the birth stories of the New Testament and the Quran, God breaks through man's skepticism, doubt and disbelief. The birth of Jesus especially stresses that God has the power to make the infertile fertile, the dead come alive, and something from nothing. Both birth stories are theocentric. It is, it is expressed in the New Testament as, for with God nothing will be impossible, in Luke chapter 1, and in the Quran, when he has ordained something, he only says be, and it is, in Surah 3. That gives rise to a third point of consensus. As in the New Testament, the accounts of Jesus' birth in the Quran say that he is not the fruit of terrestrial history, nor a human creation. He is a creature of the spirit, a creature of God. The fact of being a creature of the spirit and the product of a virgin birth distinguishes Jesus from all other prophets and messengers in the Quran, including Muhammad, the messenger, whose earthly parenty the Quran never leaves in any doubt. Yet it is precisely his creation by the spirit that means that Jesus is not an exclusive man messenger in the Quran. Creation by the Spirit and a virgin birth do not, as in the New Testament, emphasize the uniqueness of Jesus, but rather the uniqueness of God. This established a fourth point of consensus. In the birth stories of, of both the New Testament and the Quran, Jesus is God's messenger and is contrasted with all the mighty, the rich, and the tyrannical in the world. Jesus, it is, it, it is stressed, is not domineering or overweening. If we turn this around, we understand that anyone who is domineering or overweening or a tyrant or whatever stripe and, on, and origin can lay no claim on to Jesus. The Son of Mary embodies the peace of God on earth. Comparing the texts enable us to see how just independently the Quran managed to interpret biblical accounts of all sources in accordance with his theological axioms. He adopts them, intensifies them, stringently interprets them and then arranges them to support his overriding theological manifesto. Theocentricity, God as the center of the world and of history. He will, his will permeates everything. 
And the whole of creation must be understood as a sign of God. But now we come to the differences. That with the Quran consciously avoids is essential to the New Testament's key message. The designation of Jesus as the Son of God with a kingdom of which there will be no end, as it is said in the Gospel of Luke. We can boil down the crucial differences between the stories in the Bible and the Quran in various points. First, in the New Testament accounts, the birth of Jesus is Im embedded in the history of God's relationship with his chosen people. That is why the birth in Bethlehem is important, the city of David. Why contemporary political rulers are mentioned, Augustus, Herod, and why precise details of the birth story are given in a historical context. The homage paid by the astrologers and the shepherds. On the contrary, the Quran is lifted out of history. It is interested neither in the specific place of birth or residence of Jesus, no mention of Bethlehem or Nazareth in the Quran, nor in the precise time, no mention of political rulers at the time or the circumstances of the birth. Nor does it mention Joseph, whom the Bible cites as Jesus' earthly father. It focuses entirely on God's interaction with individual people, such as Zechariah, Mary and Jesus. Second point, the New Testament sources see Jesus' birth as the final fulfillment of an ancient prediction to his people. The eschatological climax of God's devotion to his people, Israel. The coming of Jesus is a new beginning brought about by the Spirit, a messianic restart for Israel and a sign for the conversion of the Gentiles. In the Quran, too, God treats Jesus with special distinction. However, the son of Mary is still a sign from God, distinctive perhaps, but one of many. And third, in the New Testament accounts, Jesus of Nazareth is the ultimate revealer of God to Israel and the Gentiles. A prophet like John the Baptist merely points to him. For Muslims, the ultimate revelation of God exists in the Quran. And it is to the Quran that all the prophets, including John and Jesus, point. Christology and Quranology correlate. The fundamental difference between Christianity and Islam is and remains that for Christians, the word of God is made man in Jesus, in Islam, so to speak. The word of God is made book in the Quran. What becomes clear to my mind is that the more closely one works on and with the sources, the more profound points of consensus one sees between Christian and Muslim beliefs, but also lasting dividing differences and claims to truth, which in the final analysis throw down the gauntlet to choose one's faith. Both of these must be voiced in, an, in, a di in any dialogue worthy of the name. The Quran's Christmas story, so to speak, should be read as a model for such a dialogue by Christians and Muslims alike. It challenges followers of both religions to reflect deeply on the secret of God's actions in the story of Jesus, analyzing it to extract what they have in common and where they differ. It is not the end of dialogue, but the basis for dialogue. It can teach us to read what unites us in the light of what divides us and what divides us in the light of what unites us. It could bring about a communicative dialogue which can go even deeper for Christians and Muslims must always be aware that they do not have, manage, or possess the secret of God. 
but wish to discover more through faith and thought. Communication with mutual respect for final decisions and final beliefs. Thank you for that contribution. Uh, again, many uh, fascinating themes which we might draw on in our discussion. But first, uh, Dr. Mohammed, could you uh, offer us a further response to those words of Professor Kushal? Absolutely. Professor Kushal, many thanks for uh, the very central similarities you've raised and the very subtle differences uh, you've mentioned. And I really completely agree with you uh, with both dimensions, the similarities as well as the differences. Uh, we don't have much time to get into every single um, uh, similarity and, and difference, but uh, I'll just focus on one very significant difference that you've mentioned, which is it is uh, the Quran that lies at the heart of the Islamic tradition, and it is uh, Jesus that, li that lies at the center of Christianity. Uh, I think this correlation between Jesus and the Quran is very, very significant when it comes to comparative studies between Islam and Christianity. And, 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 and I, I, I believe, historically speaking, this was part of, 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 of the reason that disambiguates uh, uh, that type of studies between Islam and Christianity. Uh, the Quran would always be compared to the Bible and Prophet Muhammad would always be compared to Jesus Christ, uh, which ends up creating all sorts of problems when, um, when it comes to the weight of Jesus in Christianity and the weight of Prophet Muhammad in Islam. And, and it is really tricky. Um, I believe uh, that's, uh, that's my own interpretation of, 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 of uh, Islamic theology, basically. Until uh, the Reformation movement with uh, thinkers like Muhammad Abdu, Muhammad Rashid Rida, and those 18th and 19th century uh, thinkers, um, um, Islam would be read primarily through the eyes of, of uh, of the Sunnah, which is basically the, the sayings and practices of Prophet Muhammad, uh, reflecting that, uh, that, 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 that Islam is, is, is about Prophet Muhammad. Uh, but what the Reformation movement has revisited basically was uh, to uh, re-centralize, if you like, re-centralize the Quran in the Islamic tradition and to read the Sunnah uh, in the light of, of, of the Quran rather than the, the other way around. Uh, that is to say that uh, previous to that movement, uh, uh, the Quran would be interpreted through the Sunnah, uh, which meant that uh, Prophet Muhammad would be at the center of Islam rather than the Quran. What, th what this or part, big part of what this re reformation movement contributed was uh, that to centralize, uh, uh, to centralize the Quran. And cent the centralization of the Quran uh, meant basically, basically uh, the revisitation of many uh, very important uh, theological and philosophical questions that, 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 that would have uh, bearings on how Islam relates uh, to non-Islamic religions, primarily Christianity and, uh, and Judaism. Uh, so uh, to compare Quran, to, 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 to look at the Quran as, as the center of Islam uh, really, really uh, uh, shows how, um, uh, how, how, how the Quran itself is, is at the heart and the core of, of the Islamic tradition. This, of course, does not mean that, um, uh, that Prophet Muhammad does not uh, hold a significant place in, in, in the Islamic tradition, but rather uh, that he was the, the, the implementation of, of the Quran, if you like, or the, the, the number one exegete or the number one interpreter of the Quran. Uh, or, and the same would apply to Christianity. It is not, it is not to say that the Bible uh, does not have a significant weight, but rather to say that uh, uh, he is to be read or he's, he's ba the, the Bible itself is some sort of, of an account of Jesus Christ, basically. So uh, uh, missing this point of comparison and correlation uh, uh, really creates all sorts, all sorts of uh, theological problems. So uh, thank you for uh, uh, clarifying those uh, differences as they really uh, lighten uh, such comparative studies. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. That's uh, a, a very helpful response, which I think uh, leads us very, uh, very swiftly and uh, clearly into some of the questions that we have received as a, a result of what uh, you and Professor Kushel have, uh, have discussed with us already. And the first question uh, comes from uh, Dr. Munir Anis, the uh, Anglican Archbishop of the province of Alexandria based in Cairo. And uh, he writes to say uh, he very much appreciates the Quran uh, affirming the virgin birth of Jesus. And also that it is written that Jesus is the only one born of a woman who is without sin. So what is the significance of this, Jesus's birth without sin to the thought of our Muslim friends? Uh, thank you, Bishop Munir, for such an amazing question. Um, the idea that, that, that Jesus Christ is, uh, um, is sinless, basically, uh, would place him, like in the Islamic tradition, we have uh, the concept of ulul azm min al rusul. So uh, the, the, the arch prophets, if you like. So that would place Jesus Christ with, um, with those uh, with those prophets. We have five major prophets in the Islamic tradition uh, that would include Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Those five prophets are, uh, name, are given this title, Ulul Azm min al-Rusul. Uh, Ulul Azm means uh, those prophets who were with determination and very firm, uh, very firm, uh, yeah, very firm, uh, willingness and determination in the uh, careers as prophets and messengers of, of, of God. Uh, Muslim theologians would not interpret uh, this, um, this fact, the fact that Jesus was sinless. They wouldn't, they, wouldn't inter they wouldn't interpret it in relation to Jesus' divinity or something, but rather they, 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 would, uh, they would say uh, Jesus is still a prophet and, and, and a human being like other, like, like other prophets, uh, uh, of course, that would uh, those those signs that he had the the, mir the the miracles, his determination in his in his career as a as a prophet would place him, as I said, uh, with ulul azm uh, min al rusul. Uh, yet his sinlessness wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't relate to um, to um, to di to divinity basically. Uh, and, 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 and as uh, that's, that's a common discussion that the uh, books of theology would discuss uh, basic uh, uh, in, 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 um, uh, the idea that angels as well, the angels of God, it's mentioned in the Quran that they la ya'asun Allah ma amarahum, that angels never disobey God. Uh, does the disobedience, uh, does the obedience, oh, they always obedient to God, they would never commit uh, sins. Uh, and yet this wouldn't mean to Muslim theologians that those angels would be uh, divinized or seen as uh, uh, deity, deity, deities or so. Uh, so uh, the fact that Jesus was not, uh, was, uh, sorry, the, the fact that Jesus was sinless uh, would not, uh, to Muslim theologians again, wouldn't, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't mean uh, that he, uh, he was uh, divine or something. Uh, so, but rather that he would be placed in that category, Ulul Azm uh, Min Al Rusul, a title that is given to those five, uh, five, uh, according to the to the mainstream uh, Muslim theologians, he would be one of those uh, prophets: Noah, Abraham, uh, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. Thank you, Doctor. So uh, I think uh, you, you've you've brought out building on the similarities and differences. One of the the key questions that, uh, that clearly uh, distinguishes uh, the Christian and the, the Muslim traditions around the divinity of, uh, of Christ, the divinity of Jesus. And, and uh, I, that leads me into uh, another question from uh, Professor Mona Siddiqui, uh, who for uh, those based here in, uh, in the United Kingdom will recognize uh, as a, a regular voice on thought for the day but uh, you in the academic professions would, uh, would know her more as a professor at uh, the University of, uh, of Edinburgh. But uh, uh, Professor Siddiqui has written to ask uh, you, uh, Professor Kushel, um, both to thank you for the uh, opportunity, uh, but also to ask you 
what meaningful dialogue means to you as a Christian. Why should Christian theologians engage with Islamic thought and Muslim scholars engage with Christian doctrine? Yes, thank you very much for this uh, question. Uh, I have two answers to your question. Why should I, as a Christian theologian, engage into dialogue with Muslims or dialogue at all with other religions, Judaism inclusive? Um, uh, my first answer would be the Holy Scriptures uh, as such perform already a dialogue. You cannot understand the Christian birth story of Jesus without uh, background information uh, uh, on Judaism. Uh, uh, yet, yes, indeed, uh, only the, the, the messianic tradition in Judaism explains why the Christian, specific Christian interpretation uh, is necessary and is plausible, at, le at least for a Christian audience. And you cannot understand the Muslim, the Quranic, um, uh, uh, birth story of Jesus without Christian background information. In, in other words, in order to understand each other, uh, the Holy Scriptures, they, the Holy Scriptures themselves challenge us uh, to take the other tradition seriously, uh, to gain information about that, to have a deep insight into the background uh, of this culture and religion, and these are the prerequisites of an authentic dialogue. Without mutual information, mutual background information, there is no dialogue. And uh, the, my second basic answer would be, um, uh, you want to communicate your own faith uh, with other people, to share your conviction with other people. Uh, and you can only do this to make your position, your faith commitment plausible uh, if you take uh, the background and uh, the, 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 the situation of the other, uh, your counterpart seriously. So in other words, in, in order to make my Christian faith commitment plausible to Muslims or, Jew, or to Jews, I have to know uh, many information about uh, Islam and Judaism. Um, the goal, my personal answer would be the goal of an authentic dialogue is um, to, under to better understand the otherness of the other. The otherness of the other has two sides, uh, similarities and differences. To take seriously the otherness of the other means that you really engage into the tradition of the other, and that is what I call an authentic dialogue. Thank you, Professor. I, I uh, first encountered um, Professor Siddiqui uh, more than a decade ago uh, when involved in uh, something called the Building Bridges Seminars, uh, which were at the time uh, chaired by uh, the then Archbishop Rowan Williams and involved uh, Christian and Muslim scholars coming together to look at and explore their own scriptures in the presence of the other. So it seems right. to me that, uh, that, it, that this dialogue not only enables us to understand more clearly the otherness of the other, but also enables an opportunity for us within our own faith traditions to, uh, to challenge and explore more deeply our own scriptures. And I wonder, um, uh, Dr. Mohammed, whether you might want to, uh, to offer a thought in response to uh, Professor Siddiqui's a question about what is the point of uh, of this dialogue? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, uh, Professor Mona Sadiq is a teacher, a D teacher of mine, and I, and I take pride in that. Uh, and um, and I, I see eye to eye with Professor Koshel's uh, answer. Uh, and I would add to it that um, I, I believe I engage with other religions because I believe that the ultimate truth is perennial and universal and dispersed in probably every religious tradition. So part of my commitment to that ultimate truth that I'm pursuing is to seek it wherever uh, it is and to expose myself uh, um, uh, to other faith traditions, uh, more particularly uh, the Jewish and Christian tradition, uh, which the Quran emphasizes and, and, and actually draws a lot on, uh, on 
so it's 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 only natural that we need to to, to engage and read uh, scriptures together, uh, and and also the fact that you know the the, the famous German. Uh, comparative religionist Max, Max Muller had a very important statement. Uh, who, who, who even knows one religion knows none. So uh, it's really uh, uh, a very important statement in the sense that uh, uh, the knowledge of other religions would always make you uh, really reflect basically and, and rethink your own convictions and, 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 uh, and redefine your boundaries if, if, if there are boundaries. Uh, so it's 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 it, 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 my commitment to interfaith dialogue and to interfaith studies comes from that uh, commitment to the pursuit of truth, if you like. Thank you. That uh, that is, uh, is 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 fascinating, and in in a way brings us back to uh, Professor Kushel's uh, uh, book. There there was uh, in the epilogue. Uh, there is a, a wonderful story about the Surat Maryam in uh, in Ethiopia. And uh, we have uh, a question uh, that uh, has come from uh, Prince Asfa Vossen Asarata, who uh, provoked or, or inspired that, uh, that epilogue. So uh, I'll uh, pass over now uh, to you, uh, Dr. Asfa, to ask his, uh, his question uh, of uh, Imam Muhammad. We Ethiopians are proud that the first hijra was from Mecca to Ethiopia bringing the first Muslim refugees to our country. In a nutshell, this is how the Ethiopian chronicles record the meeting of those refugees with the Aksumite emperor Hashana. He asked the leader of the Muslim delegation, what does your new religion say about my savior, Jesus Christ? The answer to that was, we call him Isa and see him as a great prophet. The second question was, what do you say about my mother, the Holy Virgin Mary? The answer to that was, we call her Mariam, and she too is revered as the Virgin Mother of the prophet Isa. The third question was, what do you say about my protector, the holy archangel Gabriel? The answer to that was, he is known to us as the angel Jibril, the messenger of God who brought the holy Quran to the prophet Muhammad. When the Negus heard this, he drew a line on the ground with his stick and said, it is only this thin line that divides our faiths. You are allowed to stay in my country. My question to the Honorable Ulema would be, what do the Holy Quran and the Hadiths say about this historical meeting? Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Asfa, for the amazing question. Um, uh, in fact, the Quran does not mention at all uh, uh, that uh, immigration or the, the first Muslim immigration from uh, Mecca to Ethiopia. Uh, but this, this um, uh, situation is, is basically uh, reported in uh, books of Sira and books of uh, historiography, if you like. Uh, recording the, 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 uh, the earliest uh, immigrations of Muslims, of that group of Muslims who migrated from Mecca to Ethiopia. Um, and it is reported in uh, Tabaqat ibn Sa'd and Sirat ibn Ishaq. Uh, these are what some of the two, of the two most important uh, sources of, uh, of the Sirah of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, and it is mentioned uh, that they met uh, the Negus in two days. In the first day, they recited chapter 19 uh, of the Quran, and the Negus uh, response was that he said, uh, indeed, this meaning referring to the Quran, and what, what Jesus came with, they came from the same source. 
that was his first and initial response in the first day. And then the second day, um, he asked further, uh, what does the Quran say about Jesus Christ? And Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, who was the main uh, man uh, speaking for the, uh, on behalf of the group, and he said that God describes Jesus as his servant, his prophet, Inni Abdullah, his, his servant, his prophet, and his spirit that he casted upon uh, Mary. And uh, Niga's response was that and instead of saying that this is the thin line between Islam and Christianity, he rather th said uh, that Jesus was referring with his, with his stick, basically, that this Jesus was no more than what you have described. Uh, so this is apparently the Muslim interpretation of, of, of uh, Niga's response. Uh, and it is really interesting that in, 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 the, in, in the Ethiopian Chronicles, it is referred to, or oh, the, 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 the story goes that he, he said that this is the thin line between Islam and Christianity. In the Islamic tradition, he rather said that Jesus was no more than what, uh, uh, what you have described. Thank you. I, I found it uh, uh, fascinating uh, reading the, the, uh, the epilogue in, uh, in Professor Kushal's book because I wasn't uh, aware of this of the protection offered by uh, the uh, the Ethiopian king to these uh, early uh, early uh, Muslim refugees in a sense at this time of Christmas where we uh, we think of uh, of Jesus taking refuge to uh, to Egypt uh, so it, that's another aspect of uh, of the, the reality of our of our faiths that uh, come to play, but I wonder, uh, Professor Kushal, if uh, if if you might uh, offer a perspective on uh, on this story. Well, I always uh, found that uh, this story is a beautiful one, uh, namely a peace building story. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Vosna Serrat uh, ten years ago uh, at my university in Tübingen. Uh, he studied there um, uh, uh, many, many years. He has a special relationship to Tübingen. And he made me aware of the fact uh, that uh, in the present situation in Ethiopia, uh, there is a desperate need for these peace-building stories because Ethio Ethiopia uh, is a divided country. 60% uh, uh, Christians, 40% uh, Muslims. And uh, he made me aware that it is of utmost importance um, uh, to bring Christians and, on, and Muslims in Ethiopia together on the basis of this story. It is a story of tolerance. It is a story of mutual respect. It is a story also of persecution because the, 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 the Meccan establishment followed uh, this delegation of uh, the early Muslims to Ethiopia and they wanted to bring them back and they, they wanted to that the, uh, the, the asylum in, uh, by the Negus is not granted. And, and uh, since the outcome is very positive uh, of this story for Muslims who, who were tolerated by the Christian ruler, uh, this story can build peace in such a divided country like Ethiopia and the situation is even today worse than 10, 15 years ago when I first met Dr. Wassen Asarata and therefore I, I, I vanish this wonderful story as in the spirit of peace. Well, I, th I think that uh, that brings us uh, in, in a wonderful way in which uh, these stories interweave. I think that can perhaps be a, a symbol for us because the first question from Archbishop uh, Munir Anis, uh, the uh, Anglican province of Alexandria includes two dioceses uh, in e Ethiopia. And I know that he has traveled many times uh, to, uh, to Ethiopia. And we have uh, a question which I, uh, I think I'll uh, take now as the final one for our uh, recording from Bishop uh, Rob Gillian, which uh, I think uh, returns us to this, uh, this theme. Uh, Bishop Rob. First, I'd like to offer my grateful thanks for your book, Professor Kershaw. Insightful, illuminating, and a delight. 
Now, one of the dominant themes in your book is peace. Islam, of course, means peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. In Hebrew, shalom. Not just the absence of conflict, but it means completeness, doesn't it? It means wholeness, multiple parts coming together. Dar es Salaam, literally the house of peace. And in Greek, irene, peace really means unity. So we have peace on earth, goodwill to all people, reconciliation, restoration are the special words. Peace with God, peace with others, peace with ourselves. And the Christmas story whispers peace. As a well-known Christmas blessing asks that we should celebrate the joy of the angels, the eagerness of the shepherds, the perseverance of the wise men, the obedience of Joseph and Mary leading to the peace of the Christ child. This is the dialogue that you encouraged. So my question is, what should peace look like, feel like, sound like in the context of Christian Muslim dialogue as the Christmas story whispers peace? For me, perhaps, it's thankfulness and joy. That might be a good place to start. Thankfulness and joy. Yes, I can uh, agree uh, totally with that. And I would like to add um, uh, one, one feature I learned now working for interreligious dialogue over so many years is the fact that I feel grateful to other traditions, the Jewish traditions, the Muslim traditions, that we share uh, common uh, uh, features, common narratives. It is not only the Jesus story, Jesus and Mary story, but also other uh, stories of biblical origin, the Abraham story, the Moses story, etc. Uh, so I am grateful that beyond the limits of the Jewish, the, of the Christian tradition, there are other people who share, uh, with whom we share these traditions and these narratives. Um, that, is a, that creates a special relationship between people of Abrahamic faith. Uh, I always thought um, uh, uh, that distinguishes people of, of Abrahamic faith, of Abrahamic origin, uh, from people of uh, Asian origin, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism. And I say that without any value statement. I only say Jews, Christians, and Muslims share together narratives, traditions, uh, uh, on, on the basis of their holy scriptures, which they do not share with the people of other origins. So that could create a special obligation, mutual obligation um, for, uh, uh, for, for dialogue, for peace, and even cooperation in, uh, in concrete uh, 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 manners. Um, uh, and therefore, uh, thankfulness and joy uh, are for me the result, the fruit of interreligious dialogue. I'm grateful that brothers and sisters share similar uh, traditions and we, we can um, uh, uh, share our, our own convictions together. Thank you uh, very much for that, Pro Professor Kushal. That uh, call, which uh, I think uh, we all, both uh, those uh, here for the recording and those uh, listening online, will uh, will resonate with. Uh, Mohammed, do you have a, a final reflection as a, a Muslim on this uh, peace question? Uh, absolutely. I mean. Uh... I, I completely agree with Professor Koshal's uh, response to that question uh, in the sense that dialogue is really, uh, today is a representation of how, or some sort of a, a, a medium or a tool with which we can materialize this piece that, that uh, the Quran and, 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 the, and, and the, uh, the, the Bible talks, talk, um, talk about. Um, we've had, especially Muslims and Christians, had a, a history of confrontation. Um, and it is really time that we, we need to come and, and, and talk and, 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 and exchange and, and have that sort of mutual enriching uh, experience. Um, 
uh, I started my my study of uh, Christianity in like some seven or eight years ago at the University of Durham, where I studied the Catholic tradition, and 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 really. Uh, uh, the amount of wisdom that I gained from the Bible that goes in line with my uh, uh, tradition in Islam is something that I really, really always appreciated and deepened my faith in God. So uh, um, I, I really can't understand why should we keep uh, uh, avoiding that sort of... Um, uh, parameters where uh, where can help us or enable us um, enrich our faith uh, faith narratives and 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 faith and, and belief and belief in God. So I uh, I really think that dialogue is 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 the place uh, or the the, the the embodiment of of that peace. Well, thank you uh, so much uh, for that. I think. Uh, as uh, we can see, this this call to dialogue, this desire for dialogue, uh, is uh, is one that is uh, is growing. So that has been a a fascinating set of uh, responses and interactions for this dialogue on Christmas and the Quran. It remains only for me to offer a very sincere. Thanks to all those who have been involved with us in this project, particularly to the Ginkgo Foundation for their collaboration, and of course to our two principal interlocutors, to Imam Dr. Mohammed Abdul Noor uh, and of course Professor Karl Yusuf Kushel. We're deeply grateful for that which you have shared with us and also for that which you have inspired us to continue in this dialogue. Thank you very much indeed.